Wood Turning with Tim is made possible by these fine sponsors. The American Beauty Tim uses was made by Robust Tools. All our lays have a seven year warranty. Our tool wrists feature a hardened rod on top. Lots of sizes to fit your lathe. Robust. Because the making matters. Thompson Lay Tools. Welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. Made by a wood turner for wood turners. Today, we're going to take a trip into deep space with cosmic clouds. I have a new friend on YouTube, Gary Lowe, and he's from across the pond. I do believe he's Scottish. I hope I get that right or I'm in real trouble. But anyway, this is his project that he came up with, and he's using iridescent paints to help highlight a rather plain piece of wood. Now, I highly encourage you to go look for Gary Lowe Wood Turner on YouTube and check out some of his other videos because he's a really good uh, teacher and he has good explanations on how to color wood. And so I learned this process from him. I don't think I've perfected it yet, but we're getting there. But what we're going to be working with today is a piece of wood. Well, actually, normally you're going to find a piece of wood like sycamore or ash, something that's really plain to do this. Unfortunately, all I could find at my local woodcraft was some ambrosia maple, which is really nice wood. So please forgive me for the sin of covering up this beautiful wood for the project, but it was all I could find right now to be able to make this. So we're gonna start off with a two inch or eight quarter blank. So that means it's two inches thick, and this is 14 inches wide. We're gonna mount this on the lay, then we'll start making the shape of the platter. Okay, now I've already gone ahead and taken my blank. I drilled a hole in it and I'm holding it on my chuck with a worm screw going into there. Every chuck comes with one. It's a really handy way to hold wood. So it's really strong. It's right there and nothing is hitting the tool rest. That's why I'm checking right now. So I'm gonna grab my half inch bowl gouge and we're gonna turn this on at a very low speed just to see what's gonna happen with this. So I'll pick up a little more speed. That's about right. And all I wanna do is clean up this edge right here and make it straight. Oops, got a light in my way there. There we go. This maple cuts beautifully. And all we need is a straight edge so we can just start working on the bottom part then. And this doesn't have to be 14 inches. You can make this 10 inches if you want, whatever size piece of wood you have. Just make sure that the wood is deep enough that you can make a little bowl in it right there. So anyway, okay, we've got that. We're gonna turn this off. And the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start making an OG shape. And let me go get this for you and explain to you what that is. OG, OG, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the platter, see the delicate curve on the side here? So it sweeps up, down, and around. So it's a curvy shape like that. It's been around for ages, but it's a beautiful shape to put on a platter. It makes it look like it's lifting up off the table or wherever it's setting. But anyway, that's what we're gonna start on next. And we'll also put a foot on there that will hold this on the chuck when we reverse it in a minute. So the first step is we just wanna kinda of smooth this out a little bit so we can start making easy cuts. And then I'm gonna whittle away at this edge and take a lot of the weight off and work my way back on the OG shape. Turn this back on, nothing's hitting. It's really close to the camera, that's kind of fun. But anyway, to do a pull cut, I just take the tool like this, put it on its edge, and just pull back. And I'm really kind of leaning my body back. And you can see that there's more air here than there is here because this is farther out and has more ability or more wiggle to it, more warp as it gets further out. So you can have the same amount of warp in here, but you won't feel it until you get out here and you can feel the chatter. But just light cuts, and this is how you level it out. 
But once I have it leveled out, what I want to start doing is working my way in in little steps. And right now I still have the lathe running at a slow speed, so I'm not moving the wood as quickly as I want to, but that comes with time. You can see I'm just taking away and getting rid of the wood I don't need. So I'm just going to whittle away at this for a little bit, and then when I get the shape a little bit closer, I'll show you how, where we are, and then we'll start on the foot. Okay, now I'm looking straight down on the platter to make sure I have the OG shape correct, and I'm not quite there yet. And you can see from the, our camera up top, we have this nice gentle sweep, and it's curving in like that. Then it gets to here and it curves back out. Now that's a little bit too much of a bump right now. So I'm gonna take that off a little bit more. And I'm gonna have to do this with this camera and go crunch to bring it down a little closer. So it'll be in focus while we do this. But let's start this back up. And I've been using a pull cut the entire time on this, not a push cut, because I, I prefer the control I have on it. So you can take this tool and just pull it like this. And so I'm gonna worry away that edge that was just way too bumpy and I'm trying to make it more subtle, and that's very close right there, as a matter of fact. As I'm looking down here, I'm looking straight down the side so I can see my profile, and that's looking really, really good. Now up here on the bottom, I wanna make sure that I'm just pushed in a little bit, that I dig in, that I dig in, <laughs> I cut in, because I want to make the foot here in a second. And I want to make sure that when this thing sits on the table, that it's going to be touching right here and not right here. I want it to have a little support so it won't wobble. So I'll just get a little bit of extra wood out of the way and just make sure I have a curve into my foot just the way I want it. Now I just use my calipers to put the width of my jaws when they expand out for a recess. Makes a lot of sense there. But anyway, that's what this little mark is. It's running right along there. So I'm going to take my bowl gouge, turn this back up, <laughs> and I'm going to just take away a little bit of wood. You have to be real careful about the depth here because you have a hole on the other side from the worm screw. So if you go too deep, you're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so all I'm really wanting to do is go in about 3 sixteenths of an inch deep so I can get a good recess in there for my jaws to expand into. So I'm just doing this with the bowl gouge, working my way back to that line, and it gives me an idea of my depth now. Yeah, I'm plenty deep here. If you think you've gone too deep, you do have one saving grace in that you can actually make a design or a shape on the bottom here and maybe curve it out a little bit, get you a little more wiggle room. And I'm not gonna get much more aggressive than I am right now. If you actually go to Gary Lowe's site, he does a really neat job of doing some decorations on the bottom, and I really like him. And we are going through this project a little bit quicker because I want you to see the painting before we run out of time. So like I said, if you go to his YouTube page, you can see how he put some texture work and some shapes in there to really decorate up the bottom of the platter. So now I'm just going in with my favorite little tool that makes my tenon shapes. It has that angle ground onto it. It's just an old bedan. Now I'll just come straight across with it and clean up the bottom right there. So now, all I'm gonna do is sand this a little bit, and then we're gonna put on some spray lacquer or sanding sealer just to seal the bottom of the wood. Okay, I'm getting my sanding sealer ready, and I have sanded this to 320 grit, just to make it nice and beautiful and smooth, and boy, I wasn't paying that much attention, but look at this wood here. Look at that fissure, the damage that this tree had. I don't know if this is wind shake or if it's just rot, but that is really beautiful. So this is gonna be a tale of two stories with this platter. You're gonna have the top side, which is gonna be cosmic clouds, and then underneath, you're gonna be seeing nature at its finest, because I love ugly wood. But anyway, I'm taking a clean, lint-free cloth and just making sure I get all the dust off of here because you don't want anything on here at all. Now, this is where Gary has influenced me a little bit. Mr. Lowe 
likes to use spray cans on his wood to do things quickly. I don't have a very good ventilation system in here, so if you do have a poor ventilation system, you need to put on a breathing apparatus which has filters and canisters on it where you couldn't hear me talk at all. The other thing is you want to open a door in a little bit <laughs> so you can let some of the air out. But I'm going to show you his technique right here, and it really, really is fast. So it's just going to be simply spraying back and forth. And look how all of a sudden it's already getting the color of the wood where we want it. Beautiful. Oh man, then I'm going to paint this. <laughs> I know, I'm going to get letters about that, aren't I? Yeah. Uh, nobody sends letters anymore. I'm going to get emails about that. But I want to make sure that I cover every bit. I see a little spot right there where it's not soaking in. And these are just light coats. You're not putting a lot on because you want this to dry quickly and keep moving. And as I start to get high from the fumes, Okay, there's another trick Gary does, and it involves this. <laughs> a hair dryer. Yes, I occasionally need one. Matter of fact, that might help right now. <laughs> Number 32 and 34 get a little out of hand, and I have to use the dryer on them every now and then. I tried a heat gun. It does not work. It doesn't blow enough air. What this does, it puts a lot of air through. So it's just the movement of air that helps dry this. So you can actually get this to dry within like two or three minutes. So I'm just going to use the air gun on this just a little bit. Maybe put a couple more coats on here before I turn it around. And then we'll be ready to start working on the top of the platter. Now I'm opening the jaws into that back recess. And you can put a little bit of a tweak on there, but don't do it too hard or you'll mar the wood on the inside and you'll have to do a little bit of hand sanding and that's not easy sanding to do. So there we go. That looks great the way it's holding right now. All we want to do, it's a real simple process. We just want to dome the lid. So this will be the high point. This will be the low point. And the curve just gives it a little more um, vibrance because the paints we're using are iridescent. So the different angles that you can have light hitting the uh, wood the iridescent paint shows a little bit different look. It's really kind of like butterfly wings if you think about it. So the neat thing about that is is that any angle you look at it since it's curved it'll always change as you go around it. It looks like it's winking at you or something. So there we go. I'm going to stop that real quick. I'm going to go a little closer. Never want to hang the tool too far off the tool rest. And I'm going to angle this a little bit so I can cheat my way down there. So we're going to start here. Again it's going to be out around. We'll pick up the speed. There we go. I'm just going to do a pull cut. A little more chatter as you get out towards the end. And this part right in here is going to go away. That'll be our bowl, so we're only really kind of worried about right here. So I'm going to work a little more on the end here to start my curve. And I'm just taking off a little bit of wood. I'm only going to make about an eighth of an inch curve to this, quarter of an inch at the most. I don't want the rim to be too thin. It needs to be somewhat thick to have a proper perspective to the width of the blank or the width of the platter because for something 14 inches wide, I don't think you want a rim on there that's only about a sixteenth of an inch thin. It's kind of awkward. It looks too thin. So I'm going to keep it about a quarter of an inch thick. So we're getting our curve already. And that actually looks pretty good. So I'm just going to make a couple more passes here, just take out any tool marks. I'm going to sand this again, like I did the back side, to 320 grit. And I'm going to apply some sealer, and then we're going to apply some paint. Okay, I have my sanding sealer on the wood right now, <laughs> and believe me, I'm starting to have regrets because, like I said, you should get a piece of sycamore or ash to do this project, not uh, ambrosia maple, and especially now quilted ambrosia maple. I am just sick that I'm going to put paint over this, and I'm sure you guys are going to hate me for it too, but, <laughs> oh well, that's the price you pay. Who knows, I might turn off the paint later. <laughs> Um, you can also see I put my surgical garb on my lathe. Um, Gary likes to just spray away at his lathe, so I have no idea what color it originally was, but it looks pretty black now. Now this stuff, I just got some stuff over at Home Depot, or Lowe's, got to give the right credit, it's Valspar Perfect Project Paint and Primer, and it's black. And uh, I want a gloss that gets it shiny. 
Uh, I'm sure um, over where Gary is, he gets stuff that's specially made by chestnut, I think, and it's ebonizing paint. So uh, we didn't have that here. So I looked as good as I could for it. Um, but anyway, we're going to paint this black. Ah, and it just goes like so. Oh no. And all you want to do is just make sure that there's no wood showing through. So it's a real light coat. And boy, if you think the fumes from the sanding sealer get to you, this gets to you. Matter of fact, we're going to have to take a break and probably evacuate the shop for a little bit while we get the fumes to clear off on this. But you can see how uh, my cloth back there is taking all the hit from this paint. So it's a good idea to have it up there. Because stubbies, uh, stubbies, oh, I didn't say that. Robust are supposed to be gray, not black. Uh, there we go. And I got every bit covered now. So we're just going to let that dry about 30 minutes or so, and we'll be back. It's kind of hot out here. Think we should open the door? That'd help. <laughs> yeah. It's still, oh man, it's gonna be 100 degrees today. Can we wait in the house? Yeah, there's air conditioning in the house, isn't there? Yep. Uh, okay, let's go. Okay, now that the paint is dried and most of the fumes are gone and we're not in Happy Town anymore, uh, we're gonna make a couple of shapes on here to designate the rim of the platter. So what we wanna do is we're gonna use a point tool, which is three flat sides and it has a point. Well made, huh? well named. Anyway, we're gonna go in here and designate the area that we wanna put the paint on. By putting these little marks in there, it gives us kinda of like a little trough to where if we run the paint off the edge, we can come back later and clean it out. And also, it gives us a little bit of an aesthetic feel to the piece. So we're gonna turn this on very slowly and bring up the speed now. And this tool is very dead simple to use. So we're just gonna put it flat now I'm, uh, you can see the reflection of the tool in the black right now, which is kind of cool. So I know when I'm about ready to make contact. Here we come. We're going to make contact now. And I'm making this about, oh, sixteenth of an inch deep. And I'm swinging it a little bit from side to side to give it some width. On the first one I did, I didn't make them very wide. And I think, I think, I think it looks a little bit better a little wider. So what we're going to do is come back here now, and I'm just guesstimating how deep I want to make, wide I want to make the bowl. So I'm going to do this about right here. Just gently push. Okay, so now my goal is right here. I'm eyeing this up. I want this band to be narrower than that one. So let's just come in here and make a mark about right so. There we go. So I'm going to turn all this away and make that the bowl part. So we have a smaller band, big band, and then a band that's about twice the size of that. Well, about one third bigger than that one. So that looks good. Okay, I have my tool rest set up for my bowl gouge again. And remember, we have a hole in there from the worm screw, so it is actually our depth gauge. So I don't want to go any deeper than that hole because I do know if I go past that, I will go down into the bottom of the platter and then we'll have a really pretty funnel. So I'm picking the speed up a little bit here just to make the cut a little cleaner. We're just going to take it out a little bit at a time here. Just little nibbles. I love that stark contrast between the white wood and the black. Gary came up with a very dynamic look for this project and I do like it. When you're doing this, sometimes that uh, black paint takes a little bit longer to dry. We tried the hair dryer on it and stuff, and it still took a little bit to go uh, to dry. So you want to make sure it is dry before you move on to the next step after this, because we're going to have to put sanding sealer on again. Because the sanding sealer then makes the base for us to put the paint on, and it allows the paint to flow. I'm going to move my light just a little bit so I can see the center. There we go. And this wood, this maple cuts beautifully, especially if you have a sharp tool. You just follow the shape around. As you get closer to the center, there's fewer feet per second, so you just got to slow down a little bit to finish your cut. 
And I'm trying to make this the shape I want it to be finished because it's easier just to keep this shape going and repeat it step after step rather than like chunking out little bits. Now if I was doing a bowl, I'd do it step by step and just work my way in a little bit at a time. But this is good practice to move your body to get that dance going. We're gonna be very careful as we get closer to the black edge there. Okay, we're really close to being deep enough. Two more passes and I think we're there. There we are right there. So we're gonna inch my way closer and make my curve pop out a little earlier. earlier. Come in here. The tool actually gets hot because of the friction of it rubbing against the wood. So it's burning my thumb right now. Whoops, okay, we just did a design modification. You saw that right here. There, now we got a clean edge. Now what are we gonna do here? We're going to take the same sanding system that we used to sand the outside of the bowl or platter, but we're gonna use one inch sanding pads because they fit inside of here better. So I'm gonna go ahead and sand this. We'll put a finish on it and then we're gonna be ready to apply the paint. Now we've very carefully taken all the dust off of our platter because we're getting ready to do the painting. And the painting is kind of fun. Um, the colors that Gary suggested we use is Josana specialty colors. And you can see how they spell color, so it is from England. <laughs> and they're iridescent. Iridescent is the important thing. That's what makes this thing shimmer and shine from whatever angle you look at it. So really pretty cool stuff. However, the wild thing about it is, is that it all looks white when you're mixing it. Um, I mix my stuff all the time in little Dixie cups, which I think is very handy and very frugal because I just throw them away. They're one use things and no big deal. Well, the problem I had was, is I started looking at this later and I saw, well, there's some deep white on there. How'd I get white in there? Well, that's the Dixie cup dissolving. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. So I've got out three of my wife's antique little bowls here. And so if this color stains it, I'm in a lot of trouble. Um, we're going to do it a little different color. We're going to try blue this time. And then we're going to do green and purple. And so that's what it looks like. And you don't need a ton of this. I just way too much right there to tell you the truth. And so we have this other stuff, which is called Liquitex. Now this is flow aid. Sounds like something you'd want the older you get, right? <clears throat> but you use this to actually help water down put about half and half here. That's real scientific looking, isn't it? So you use it to just make this a little more liquidy so it will flow better. So you use it when you're using airbrushes and stuff so it'll make paint thinner so it goes through that really neat airbrush bit. But with us, we want it thin because we're gonna use an airbrush but not in the typical way. But we do want this to go on the wood and kinda squiggle around without a lot of resistance. And so actually, I'm gonna make that a little thinner because I found out, if you can look at this, Brian can see it probably, you almost see some white on there. The white is when the color is a little bit too thick. Apparently, for this iridescence to work, you almost have to see through the paint. And when I started layering the colors on top of each other, I noticed I started getting more of a white effect. So the thing I'm gonna try this time, which is gonna be a little bit different, is I'm gonna try to not overlap the colors as much. So anyway, we're just gonna take a little bit of this not a whole lot, just drop it on. It doesn't take much at all. Well, that's plenty right there. Three drops, okay. So what are we gonna use to move that around? I said airbrush, correct? Well, I got my handy dandy, cheapest airbrush I could find on Amazon. This is like 13 bucks, it's a little pot one. 
So I guess you put paint in there and it does that. The thing I had to buy extra was a six foot hose with a quarter inch adapter to go onto my air hose so I could actually get air from my compressor. One thing to remember <laughs> is you gotta crank this down to like 30 PSI or somewhere around there, or you're gonna blow this thing up. So here comes the fun part and the delicate part. So we're gonna just take this and we're gonna move it. Now, can you see the blue starting to appear? Isn't that cool? That's also why the black is there. The black gives you a background which allows the blue to show up. So I'm gonna try to make this look as spread out as possible, but those three do drops go a long way. So you can go down hard and make it move away. You can make it look a little splattery. Also, the webbing in there does look cool. That kind of gives it that cosmic cloud look that made uh, Gary name it what he did. We were trying to think of another name for this, but we figured he came up with the best one. So you can leave it jagged, or you can go right up to the edge very carefully. See how it's getting right there? I gotta be real careful that it will go in. But if you do go in, I didn't there, well, did a little bit. You can actually come down here and blow hard and clear it out. Also, you can remount this on the lathe and just take your point tool and repoint that because we're gonna put sanding sealer on this again here in a minute. So I'm gonna move that around like that. So that's looking pretty good. There's a little crack in here, which is kind of interesting. The wood had a lot of fissures in it. So it's got some character, but I'm going to grab some violet now and we're gonna mix that up. Woo, well too much again. A lot, a little of this goes a long ways. I'm kind of wasting this. I'm not being very frugal. So we'll put our stuff in there again. Take a new stir stick so we don't blend our colors and mix it up. So far, I don't think it's staining these, so I think I'm in the good with my wife. <laughs> but it's amazing, you mix this up and it's white. So I actually, when I did this and I had my Dixie cups, I labeled them as to what color they were so I wouldn't get things mixed up. So we're gonna come in here and just do a little drop in like so. One, two, you can see that one's a little bit thicker. So the thickness can be an issue, but it all blows. So here we're gonna come in to delicately try to come in and just touch the edge of that blue, see? If I don't mix it too much, I think I'm gonna get a pretty cool effect. So we're meeting right there just a little bit. A little bit of overlap might give me a cool white effect. So we're just gonna keep doing this gently. Oops, there's a little overlap there. Well, we got more overlap. <laughs> it is a finesse game at times. So I'm gonna keep doing this for the next few minutes and spread this out. I'm probably gonna go green for my next color, I think. And again, like you said, you can leave gaps to make it look more cloud-like, and I think I will in that case. It's getting a little narrow anyway. So we'll try to spread that out a bit and make it look a little sprayed. And it'd be really cool is what if you put this on the lathe and then spun it and see what would happen. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna keep doing this for a few minutes and we'll be right back. Things are progressing really nicely. I do like the pattern I'm going with now this time, rather than the other one where I overlapped a lot. And so I am, whoa, that's way too much green. Of course, talk and screw up. <laughs> but anyway, um, I like the fact that we have just little bitty black holes between these and nothing's really overlapping. I am finding out the more I do this, the more that the airbrush can help you out with stuff. Kind of do this upside down because of the camera being there but I'll blow that in there. Again, if you get to that edge, you can always remount this and turn away any paint that drops into there, or you can use this to blow it out. But I'm finding out if you kind of have fun with how you hit it, you can start making these patterns in there. So it makes it look a little more nebulous, a little more cosmic cloudish type of thing. And Brian and I were talking as I was doing this and we decided to leave the black holes in there because not all space is colored or fooled like this. There are blacks in there and things like that. So I think it's a really neat effect. I'm gonna clean that out right there. See how it blows the paint right out of that little groove. 
So we'll just keep moving this along. I think I'm going to put down some purple and I'm done. Yeah, that's blue. That's purple. Okay. Yep. And remember I said a little bit went a long ways? Well, I had exactly the right amount of paint, it turns out. That's about how much you need to mix up to make it work. Whatever that was. I have no measurements. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to finish this up here and keep laying down this. And I'm going to try to find... I'm going to take a paper towel, though. One of the cool things you can do is you can back up a little bit, just take off the excess so you don't wind up with too much because I want purple to finish this area up. So now I can come back in here and blow that. Take off a little bit of the excess there. So now I'm back to my edge and that looks natural. So here's our purple. We'll drop it in. I'll try not to go so heavy this time. Isn't that cool how it changes colors the second it touches the black? So we'll finish this up. The last step that you're going to want to do with this is let it dry for a day, maybe even more, because the flow enhancer, uh, whatever you call it, basically makes the paint a little wetter too, so it's a little slower to dry. So this is not going to be a hair dryer, Gary style, dry in 15 minutes thing. But I do have hats off to Gary because he's got some other videos on his YouTube site where he's showing other ways of coloring and he's really inspiring me to start thinking about different things to do to the surface of the wood that I'm turning. So give him some love and visit his YouTube site. Look for Gary Lowe Wood Turner and you'll find him. And you'll love his accent. He's a great guy. <laughs> He's really good on camera. Anyway, so that is how you make a cosmic cloud bowl. The only thing that's lacking is one more coat of sealer after it dries on top. And then we are done. So look at that. And I mean, look at the colors popping on that thing. It is incredible. So, again, that is how you make Gary Lowe's Cosmic Cloud Platter. Not bowl, sorry, platter. So anyway, until the next time, see you on Wood Turning and Keep Turning. American Beauty Tim uses was made by Robust Tools. All our lays have a seven year warranty. Our tool wrists feature a hardened rod on top. Lots of sizes to fit your lathe. Robust. Because the making matters. Thompson Lay Tools. Welcome to a new level of professional wood turning tools. Made by a wood turner for wood turners.